good evening. I'm Bart Thurber, the Anne Hendricks Bass Director of the Francis Lehman Mobart Center. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome everyone to this evening's faculty panel, which is organized in conjunction with our current special exhibition, Miracles on the Border, Retablos of the Mexican Migrants to the United States on view to the general public through December, 5th, December 13th. Tonight, we are joined by an amazing array of professors from Vassar College who represent diverse disciplines and will reflect on different aspects of these fascinating artifacts. I'd like to start off by introducing David Tavares, Professor of Anthropology and Director of Latin American and Latino Latino Studies. David has been a wonderful partner on this project since we first discussed these retablos, presenting them at the Art Center. He was the first to introduce bilingual labels as part of a display he presented in conjunction with his course on Mesoamerican worlds. And we are proud to say this is the first special exhibition to be presented entirely in English and Spanish. Professor Tavares is a historian of Latin America, a linguistic anthropologist, and a Mesoamericanist. Educated at Harvard University and the University of Chicago, he has been at Vassar College since 2003. His courses and research focus on religion, calendars, ritual practice, colonial uh, Nahuatl and Zapotec texts, campaigns against idolatry, indigenous intellectuals, and native Christianities. He is the author of Invisible War and more than 50 peer-reviewed articles and chapters, editor of Wor Words and Worlds Turned Around, and co-author of Painted Words and Chimahuapan's Conquest. His work has been funded by the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment of the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, and the Mellon Foundation, and he serves as a reviewer for Science and Humanities Councils in the United States, Mexico, Chile, and Poland. At the end of Professor Tavares' presentation and the other responses by our faculty colleagues, uh, he will open it to, uh, we will open it to questions. Please direct any of your questions uh, to the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, and I, I will then moderate uh, the questions at the, end of the, uh, uh, at the end of the faculty panel. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Tavares. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart, for this wonderful introduction. And it's a pleasure uh, to be with all of you today. Um, today, I have been asked to briefly introduce a magnificent and vibrant exhibition, Miracles on the Border, currently on view at Vassar College's Love Art Center. This display of retablos, or small votive images, painted for display in churches, come from the collections of Douglas Massey, the Henry G. Bryant Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University, and um, from the collection of Jorge Duran, Professor of Anthropology at the Universidad de Guadalajara. These two scholars who co-directed the Mexican Migration Project started to collect these retablos in the late 1980s in order to study them as highly representative and emotive vignettes about the experience of Mexican migrants in the United States. Even though a Greek or Roman worshiper might have divine their purpose, the retablos in the Miracles on the Border exhibition at Vassar's Love Museum have a distinct genealogy that emerged during early Christian evangelization in Latin America. In classical antiquity, votive images in the shape of eyes, limbs, and other body parts were left in Greek, Etruscan, and Roman places of worship. While Christians later adopted the practice of leaving anatomical miniatures as an expression of gratitude, an antecedent of retablos can be traced to a sanctuary where the cult of two Mexica goddesses, Sihuacoat and Chicomecoat, was displaced by the momentous arrival of a new deity, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Sometime around 1555 or 1556, according to Nahua chroniclers, large crowds that included wealthy Spaniards started making pilgrimages to a small church in Tepeyacac, devoted to Guadalupe. Archbishop of Mexico Alonso de Montúfar praised this devotion, but several Franciscans denounced it as suspect and argued that an image painted by Marcos, an indigenous artist, could not possibly work legitimate miracles among Spanish and native worshipers. While Montúfar and other devotees won this contest, various images were worshipped in succession. 
Marcus's Mary was replaced in 1566 by a lavish Guadalupe image made of silver, which was eventually replaced by the image now known to all of Guadalupe's faithful, brown skin and painted on a cloth rep uh, repeatedly worn by Juan Diego, the indigenous man who first saw this apparition according to the canonical narrative. Now I'm going to share uh, my screen because I have a couple of images to, to share with you. So we should place retablos in a line of descent that extends from unsanctioned images in 16th century shrines to popular expressions of art and piety by way of the domestic colonial shrines that were known by the hybrid now a Spanish term, Santopan, place of saints. In Spanish, retablo simply means altarpiece, but clearly examples in this exhibition have little in common with the ornate altarpieces that grace Mexican colonial churches and which embody both collective devotions and an abundance of riches. Our retablos, in contrast, are highly personal expressions of faith that certify particular Christian devotions as miraculous by depicting a narrative of wonder in words and images. Three examples from the Duran Arias collection reveal narratives that emphasize resilience and endurance by migrants who confronted hardships and danger in order to provide for their families in a strange land. So I turn to my first image, which you see on the screen right now. This is a 1918 work that memorializes the fear of being lost and the relief of finding one's way in a foreign city. In 1918, Matias Lara called on Our Lady of San Juan de los Lagos to help him find his way in the city of Chicago. And the painting provides an imaginary cityscape complete with white streets and large menacing cars. Lara was part of a wave of migrants to Chicago and other US cities that began after the Mexican Revolution of 1910 and which was first chronicled by Mexican anthropologist Manuel Gamio in 1926 and 27, when he collected autobiographical migrant accounts. Hence, Lara's vignette could easily have been included in Gamio's book, The Mexican Migrant, published in 1930. Another important retablo not shown in this exhibition was commissioned by Domingo Segur in 1932. It depicts his wondrous delivery from death by drowning after he was dragged by the currents of a large river that marks the border between Mexico and the US, a river called Rio Bravo south of the border, Rio Grande north of it. The anonymous artist provides a canonical depiction of Our Lady of Los Lagos, a very popular image in these retablos, but his depiction of the bridge has little in common with the Juarez and Paso Santa Fe bridge, which was rebuilt in 1927 and which would have stood over Segura as he tried to swim across the border. Finally, the Virgin of Guadalupe herself makes an appearance in a retablo ordered by Bernabe H. and Caterina V. in 1944. Flanked by our Lord of the Little Willow, Nuestro Señor Saucillo, and Our Lady of Los Lagos, Guadalupe presides over the couple's gratefulness as Bernabe convalesces from an attack of cramps in a hospital in remote Nebraska. In sum, and I'm gonna end my screen share here, in spite of recent divisive rhetoric against migrants and their suffering across the globe, and particularly in terms of the tragedies that take place every day uh, for people who cross the uh, US-Mexico border, this exhibition showcases the extraordinary resilience of Mexican migrant workers and their families. It also urges us to reflect on our personal histories of migration, loss, and endurance as we admire the narratives presented in these retablos. Thank you very much. So that's um, a uh, right prepared uh, as an introduction. And I guess, uh, the next step would be to introduce the next uh, panelist, which is going to be uh, Professor Marcela Romero Rivera. It is my pleasure to introduce Marcela Romero Rivera, who is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Hispanic Studies at Vassar College. Her field of studies is a political history of Mexico, and her work deals more specifically with the place of women in revolutionary processes. She is currently working on a manuscript about the work of female Mexican artists around violence in the Mexican contemporary context. Welcome, Professor Romero Rivera. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Tavares. Uh, so 
yeah, uh, what I want to do today, I'm also going to start a screen share. What I want to do today is to give a little bit of context by uh, bringing in different voices that have written and, and uh, thought about this particular type of representation that occupies us uh, today, which are retablos or ex votos, as they are also commonly known. So uh, the, the way that I wanted to present this was uh, by bringing in three different voices and three different um, views on, on what this type of representation can mean. And I titled this uh, uh, Three Ways of Seeing a Miracle, right? And um, I, I'll just you know, jump right into it. And the first voice that I want to to invoke here uh, for our discussion is the voice of Anita Brenner, uh, who was a Mexican USian uh, uh, art critic, and also she was very important as a cultural trans cultural translator, uh, responsible to for for presenting the the texture of the culture of Mexico to the to the U.S. and uh, and the to the US specifically, but also to the world audience uh, after the, the revolution had uh, began. So in this book that, that you see uh, the, the first pages of here, Idols Behind Altars, Anita Brenner says, has this to say about um, retablos. And I will show you some of the images of the, of the exhibit as I'm re uh, reading Anita Brenner's words. So I quote, I'm going to quote um, uh, extensively from the chapter dedicated to retablos in Idols Behind Altars. To see and to paint a miracle, you should be able to recognize the combination of elements present in it. If you believe what you, see, what you say when you pray, and if you are moved to pray, you are vividly enough aware of miracles to think that you can reproduce them. You, can, you consider that it would be terror not to have this conviction. Whether because you paint or you pray, it would be difficult to decide. Because both are national habits. You are blind indeed in Mexico if you have not seen at least one miracle. Hence, the enormous sum of painted testimony in the churches from colonial days to this morning. Mexican history, never adequately written, has been painted for saintly patronage. A collection of ex votos from all over the country would give the lives, the thought, the happenings and concerns of each place and of all people, and would give it more honestly than any narrative, more accurately than a uh, most careful statistical survey. From place to place and period to period, significantly, occupation, situations, official clothings, progress in caravan against a changeless, endless background, vibrant of human trouble and of racial and agonies throughout. Plagues, droughts, conflicts are dated and described. So many people painting so many things common to all develop a language. The artistic conventions of miracle boards grow out of, the col of a collective participation and interest in the craft. Nearly anyone who can see a miracle can paint it. But for those who, are not, who have not the time or the paints, there is in every quarter where miracles occur, a professional miracle artist whose rates are low on account of mass production. The profession exists also because the people being so pleased with the artistic fashion introduced to them and being conservative adapted the occupation to national economics. As, as it was their tradition. The miracle artist is an extremely useful person in a Mexican community and is, a much, is as much a contributing member of it as the butcher of the brick or the bricklayer. The result is always a depiction without false or overemphasis because there is no feeling that this was an extraordinary event. Nobody is trying to sell anything. The picture is therefore the first thing that a picture should be, that is, convincing. The mind that admits multiple possibilities in human events 
admits any form pictorially that will give the exact set of sights and sensations that, that, it, that was experienced. The conventions develop, grow, are not imposed. They grow in direct, in direct relation to the subject and the public, divine and human. Since furthermore, collectively, these people can speak as they think in terms of seeing and making. Miracle painting is a plastic and graphic art, not a literature. The freedom for which modern artists claimer exists here without claimer and precisely frequently in the forms claimered about, though unconscious or rather not thought of, not thought out as a, a theory of art before the particular picture which demanded that particular form was painted. So these are the words of Anita Brenner um, when considering this, this particular form of art. So as you see, she doesn't consider that a miracle is really a miracle, but more of a, um, a language that is developed organically among, among the people in Mexico, which she, she argues that, ha that have this particular relation, this very um, nationally marked relation to visual perception. And this, and, and this, you know, a comment that she has about the, uh, the freedom of this form was de definitely taken up by other types of artists that, that tended to, um, to actually sign their work, <laughs> like uh, Frida Kahlo, for instance. And we can, we can go over a few of the, of the ex votos that Frida Kahlo painted. And we can see that she uses the form here to explore the, the trauma. This would be a second way, the second way that I'm, that I'm presenting of seeing a miracle, or rather to use this space of the miracle as almost like a space for just putting together the elements that have been altered and disassociated after a, an instance of trauma. For uh, um, Anita Brenner, who was also a contemporary of Frida Kahlo, uh, it, this is very important, the, the way in which the visual evocations of these images can help uh, uh, traumatize people to get over the, the horrors of the violence that the revolution brought about. Uh, and in this case, in the, in the case of Frida Kahlo, we see uh, how this can be translated also to a personal narrative, right? And so in these in this two uh, pieces, we see the same form of the ex voto right? Only uh, without any narrative, without any dedication. And again, only as a, as a way of starting the recovering process after a, a, a moment of trauma. The, th uh, the third way that I want to propose that we can read this miracle is uh, in contemporary terms. And here I want to take the, the work of an urban anthropologist called um, Julie Ann Boudreau, and she argues very interestingly that the, the form of the ex voto is still present today, but, in, but we see it not only in, in tins as, as we see it in the images of, of the collection, but also in the little, I don't know if you can see this here, um, but in the little altars that we find in the, in the streets of any Mexican town or any Mexican or any uh, neighborhood in, in Mexico City. And we see other depictions as this one of the Virgen de Guadalupe inside of a, um, a prison in, in, this, in the same place. Uh, and the way that she explains this permanence or this um, uh, constant presence of the same form, uh, she explained it, uh, explains that because of the or thinking about the relation that the Mexican political subject has to power, and where she explains that that we like Mexican people we tend to have a clientelist um, uh, relation to the figures of power. We always want those figures to intercede for us uh, and to grant us uh, favors uh, from authorities over who we don't we don't feel that we have any any control or any power. And so she calls this uh, protective care work, right? And she compares it with a, with a work that uh, is undertaken by various actors. And here I quote, um, I quote her. 
solidarity between neighbors, local associations, clientelist chains of fidelity and care for a protective saint, this personalized regime of patronage, uh, patronage based protection and religious artifacts has a long history. In places like Mexico, where the modern state is based on a rule of law that cannot be separated from popular culture, protection is something we familiarly recognize through patronage and clientelism. People usually work with mediators, like a charismatic local character, a non-elected representative, representative such as civil servants, or a statue, statue of a saint in order to have their, their claims heard. I'm going to uh, skip a little bit here, just to go back to Anita Brenner. And, um, and to, uh, to close, I want to say that Anita Brenner, even though she didn't really um, believe that the miracles of the, um, that were represented in the ex photos were all that rare, and she said, she said that you know, they occurred all the time, and they, were, they referred to things small and big, like, a, I don't know, a kid swallowed a nail and he survived. And, it, you know, and he got the same type of ex voto as a man that crossed the border and, and came back um, safely, right? So she says that, or she considers that, like, you know, there's this very Mexican um, overabundance of, of miracles that are everywhere. If you pay attention in Mexico, you will see one. But uh, I think that there's another, there's another, type of intervention, necessary intervention, almost like a superhuman intervention that she recognizes. Um, it's, there's another way, I, I think, of, of, of seeing something miraculous. Uh, and Anita Brenner reminds us of this, um, of this particular instance um, that she was a direct witness to. Um, and she called this the Mexican Messiah in referring to the Mexican Revolution. The age of the eruption of all the demands that were accumul accumulated in all those painted tins. In her book, The Wind That Swept Mexico, she traces the, traces the history of the Mexican Revolution using only archive photographs and, and depictions. And in the emancipation, sorry, uh, in the revolution, Brenner sees not the miracle, but the time of the redemption of all injustices and the emancipation of the Mexican people. And in this man that I'm showing you here, Pancho Villa, Zapata, Lázaro Cárdenas. And in this man, she says, not the saint, not the clientelist relation to power, but the leaders and the organizers that not without personal and collective sacrifice brought about the messianic time of the revolution. That's yet another way of seeing a miracle. Um, thank you so much. I hope that we have time at the end to go back to this to these questions during the the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Romero Rivera, and I return uh, to introduce uh, our last speaker before we take questions uh, comments from the audience. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Kirsten Wesselhoff. Assistant Professor of Religion at Vassar. She is an ethnographer of ethics and social change in the Islamic tradition, who teaches courses on Islamic studies, religion and social sciences, Muslim ethics, and gender and religion. She is currently preparing a book manuscript on Muslim education, social activism, and intellectual culture in Greater Paris. Her articles and essays have been published in Journal of the American Academy of Religion, Journal of Muslim Minority Affairs, Journal of Religious Ethics, and the Oxford Review of Education. She received her PhD from the Committee on the Study of Religion at Harvard University. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, David uh, and Marcella and Bart uh, and everyone for, for having me here. This is really an honor to be able to speak to this um, really remarkable exhibition. I am also going to share my screen. Um, and uh, share some of the images with you. Here we go. Um, before I speak, okay. Um, so in viewing this remarkable exhibition, I was immediately struck by the ways that the retablos address and interweave many varied sources of fear, 
danger, oppression, calamity, and constraint. They go from illnesses and operations to car accidents, from the difficulties of migration and the dangers of river crossing to detention and imprisonment. Taken together, these images point to the multitude of powers at once seen and unseen, at once predictable and arbitrary, that shape the lives of those who commissioned them. Natural forces within one's own body and within the outside world, medical systems, labor conditions, political regimes, borders, and violence of many kinds. But the images all point to understandings of other powers as well, benevolent powers of protection and deliverance, miraculous interventions that ultimately can transcend calamity and constraint. These benevolent powers of God, the Virgin, and other intercessory saints are not random or capricious, but are responsive and attentive to the sincere prayers of the devoted believer. The images reminded me of three different sources that I want to share with you this evening, and they sort of come from different places of my thinking as a scholar, approaching these images as a scholar of religion. One is historical and sociological, one is theological, and one is artistic. So I was first thinking of the work of Robert Orsi, who's one of the foremost historians of American religion. And uh, Orsi wrote a history and sociology of the devotion to St. Jude among US Catholic women across the 20th century. St. Jude, who's known widely as the patron saint of hopeless causes, rose at the beginning of the Great Depression to become one of the most popular, beloved, and besieged saints of the United States by the end of the 20th century. Orsi recounts how Jude himself was a migrant. He tells us how a Claritian priest, Jaime Tort, born and ordained in Barcelona and subsequently dispatched to the Canary Islands, to Mexico City, to Arizona, and finally to Chicago, installed a small statue of St. Jude in a newly built chapel in a Mexican neighborhood of Chicago in 1928. Uh, Padrecito Tort had developed a personal devotion to St. Jude when he found a holy card of the saint left in a pew in a chapel in Prescott, Arizona, perhaps left there by a traveler or by a migrating miner. St. Jude was the object of a small culture of devotion in Central and South America, where he was known as the patron of desperate causes and last resort. There was a shrine to him in Santiago, Chile, but at this point, no culture of devotion to St. Jude in the United States. So while this chapel in Chicago was dedicated to the Virgin of Guadalupe and the retablo behind the altar depicted her, it was the minor statue of St. Jude that began to become the major draw. Catholics from all over Chicago, both Mexican and of all ethnic backgrounds, began flooding the chapel of Our Lady of Guadalupe to pray to St. Jude and to bring to him the causes that they considered hopeless. Orsi describes how the daughters of Irish, Italian, and Polish immigrants developed an enthusiastic culture of devotion to St. Jude, centered in Chicago but quickly spreading beyond it. Soon thousands of miracles were being attributed to him each year. Orsi writes that prayer is not an innocent social or psychological activity. He describes how it's always situated in specific discrepant environments of social power and derives its meaning in relation to these configurations. And we see this in almost every one of these images of retablos that we have in the exhibition. He writes how persons at prayer are working to negotiate a sense of the possible and the good, usually in situations in which the givenness or the constraints of the world have been undermined. As they work on the world like this, or as he writes, the world is also working on them. He points out how Jude, like all intercessory saints, is a border crosser, migrating between the human and divine worlds in order to secure the health, the safety, and the flourishing of those who appeal to them, to appeal to him. And we see this profoundly in the images in this exhibit. The second thing I want to share is uh, from Gustavo Gutierrez, the famous Peruvian Catholic theologian who is known as one of the founders of liberation theology. Gutierrez writes of a preferential option for the poor that he argues structures the Christian faith. He writes that the poor person does not exist as an inescapable fact of destiny or society. His or her existence is not politically neutral and is not ethically innocent. The poor are a byproduct of the system for which we are responsible. They are marginalized by our social and cultural world. They are the oppressed, exploited proletariat, robbed of the fruit of their labor and despoiled of their humanity. 
Hence, the poverty of the poor is not a call to generous relief action, but a demand that we go and build a different social order. This unqualified affirmation of the universal will of salvation, Gutierrez argues, has radically changed the way of conceiving the mission of the church in the world. The work of salvation is a reality which occurs in history. And this intervention, this last point, is a sort of central intervention of the liberation theologians. And we see a, a version of this reflected in the Irritablo images, an implicit understanding that God, and by extension, the intercessory saints, are on the side of the oppressed, and the defined action seeks to support believers in bringing about true justice in this world, not in the next. The kingdom of God for Gutierrez was not an eschatological aspiration, not a, a vision of a divine, of an, another world in which justice would be served, but a promise to be enacted in the time and space in which we lived, in which we live. The, the third thing that I want to share with you is a different uh, exhibition, actually, uh, which I was reminded of immediately when I saw these images. And this is an uh, ex uh, exhibition of photography, a series of photographs um, that are organized and gathered by the documentary uh, photographer Jim Lomason. Lomason uh, took images um, through uh, connections with uh, Syrian and Iraqi refugees in uh, Michigan and Minnesota, took images of items that the refugees uh, had brought to share, had brought with them from Syria and Iraq uh, on their journey and ended up in the United States. Uh, these images are not devotional and the items uh, depict everyday objects rather than deliberate symbolism and artistry as we see in the retablos. And yet, so, so Lomasen took the images and then returned to the owner's uh, archival quality uh, print on this white background, and then they added a commentary of their choice to contextualize the images. So these commentaries speak to similar themes as we see in the retablos. Faith, divine protection and guidance, estrangement from family across borders, and inextinguishable hope. Uh, this is an image of uh, a copy of the Quran, of the sacred text of Islam, that was brought and carried for protection and guidance during an uncertain journey. This is an image of family photograph uh, with commentary by the person who, who brought it of the different dis of the dispersion across borders, uh, both in life and in death of all of the members of the family who were scattered. Uh, and this is a, a pair of shoes and the, the, the owner of this pair of shoes um, rights of them as a, a visa to freedom or a passage to freedom. In Islamic tradition and Islamic ethics, the virtues of gratitude and endurance are intimately linked to one another. There's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that every possible, every event offers the opportunity to the believer for a blessing. If the event is a trial, it offers the opportunity for the blessings of endurance and patience. If it is a happy event, it offers the opportunity for gratitude, for thanksgiving. I see in the retablos also a speaking to the relationship between these virtues. Every expression of gratitude is imbued with the memory of the endurance. Every uh, trial endured carries in it the possibility of, uh, of the relief of suffering and of gratitude in the future. So I wanted to share these these three uh, sort of pieces of religious culture with you this evening as a way of uh, seeing the kind of some of the uh, spiritual relationships or, or architecture of the retablos reflected um, in, in many other different times and places. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, actually, Kirsten and uh, Marcella, if you could uh, put your cameras on so we can have uh, all three of you available to answer any questions. So for those of you uh, following us uh, this evening, uh, please feel free to post any questions that you may have in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, I, I'd, uh, first of all, I actually want to follow up, uh, Kirsten, uh, to mention to people that outside the LOBE, uh, first for the campus this week, and then uh, next weekend for the general public, uh, we also have the uh, 45,000 quilt project, which relates nicely to some of the themes that you had introduced uh, specifically, and I'm just reading a brief uh, description of the project, activists and artists from 12 US states 
uh, and uh, Mexico have joined forces to create 45,000 quilt project to call attention to the 45,000 people who on an average day in 2019 were imprisoned by uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Evoking the famous AIDS quilt, the 45,000 quilt project has 45 individual quilted panels, each with a thousand marks created across the continent and stitched together into five large panels. Uh, and uh, there's for, uh, this is a project that is co-sponsored between the Lobart Center and the Consortium on Forced Migration, Displacement and Education and uh, want to encourage people to take advantage to see that also in the context of uh, many of the themes that all of you have introduced this evening. So uh, with that, I, I, I do have a question uh, and, uh, and of course any questions that you may have for each other as well. Uh, but I was, I, I can't help but uh, I keep on looking at uh, the retablos uh, over and over again and always see different details. And it was actually out of a conversation I had last week that uh, made me think about um, those that are signed. And I was just looking at some of the examples that were introduced this evening. There was Aurora Fra uh, Frausto uh, from 1968 in San Antonio, who had just recovered from a grave illness. Um, and then another one was uh, Juan Jose Sanchez from 1990, who was asking uh, to be freed uh, from incarceration in the United States. It's interesting this, when they're signed and, and specifically the gender aspect. And I just wonder if, if any of you have in your considerations, uh, not just of the retablos, but, but specifically of the different categories, Marcella, that you had introduced uh, uh, about the role of gender uh, in, uh, in voice and narrative, uh, as well as representation. So I just wanted to suggest that as a possible topic. Okay, if I, uh, if I had to venture an answer or a comment uh, uh, to, your, to your question, Bart, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, I'm not very sure about the the names that that you mentioned. I'm not clear that those are that those are meant to be the names of the 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 author, the the person that actually painted the paint, because there are so many people that are um, alluded to or included in one of these representations, right? Like so, there's a person that asks for the favor, who intercedes uh, with the with the saint. There's of course the saint that can also be gendered, right? It could be like a saint, like San, um, San Juditas, which is which is San Jude, um, or uh, La Virgen de los Lagos, or you know, it, it could it could go uh, either way, gender-wise. And there's also the person that for whom the miracle is is uh, asked, right? So in my absolutely anecdotal non-academic experience of, of seeing this, this type of um, devotional uh, showings, I guess. Um, I, I think that men and women are equally, I would say that, that they participate equally in terms of, of numbers and, you know, going, going to, like doing this uh, pilgrimages to this, to these places where these saints are, are kept and, you know, where they, considered to be more miraculous than, than in other places. But it definitely, this idea of intercession, intercession right? Um, it's very much um, tied to the idea of the virgin and then the figure of the female. The female is supposed to be the soft part that is going to intercede for, for the person who is asking for the miracle uh, in front of a higher authority, right? So, so that's, that's what I, I would have to say, you know, off the top of my head about the gender distribution of the, or the gender expectations around, um, you know, asking for miracles. Um, in Mexico City, my, my apartment in Mexico City is two blocks away from the main temple where St. Jude, uh, San Juditas um, uh, is kept. And I, you know, I, I see probably more men than women bringing in statues. Uh, but like I said, it's always through the, the figure of the mother that we imagine that that we have a better chance, I think, to to make a, to uh, make God hear, you know, what we what we have to ask of Him. 
Um, but I don't know. I don't know if if David has a different impression or or Kirsten. Um, but that would be that would be my my inkling. Again, very anecdotal, not very academic. But um, yeah, that's that's what I can say. Uh, very briefly, uh, I would say just in response to gender, um, the uh, Durand Massey exhibit of retablos comes from a particular part of Mexico. I mean, there's no um, the reason why you have San Juan de los Lagos and the region of San Juan de los Lagos repeated there so much is that um, the core of it comes from West Central Mexico. And in the cattle for exhibit, they talk about this particular uh, male painter who's called Vicente Barajas, who uh, has painted hundreds of retablos. So here's the, the issue in terms of signatures and names. Uh, what you often have is uh, uh, the representation of the devotees, their names. Sometimes you don't even have last names. You don't need last names, you just need first names. Uh, the painter himself uh, rarely signs this because these are supposed to be uh, more or less uh, transitory in the sense that uh, um, the retablos are basically meant to be placed uh, as a representation of uh, you know, miracle that was working your life by, uh, you know, the Virgin of Los Lagos or uh, uh, Jesus of the Conquest or all of these miraculous figures from West Central Mexico. Um, and in terms of gender, there's some, um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, as Marcel is saying, uh, men might actually want to commission this uh, uh, images as, as much as women. Sometimes you have uh, in particular mothers that are left behind in Mexico that uh, talk uh, in precise terms. There's a very nice one actually about somebody who interceded for her own daughter uh, so she would come back uh, a, uh, uh, in good shape uh, without having anything uh, done to her uh, while in the U.S. and she can, uh, comes back to her mother and therefore the mother commissions a retablo uh, uh, for having uh, had that protection granted uh, uh, by the Virgin of Los Lagos. So uh, I think there's a back and forth in terms of gender. Uh, in terms of painters, uh, as I emphasize, I mean, there's uh, only a handful of known painters. Uh, uh, some of them make hundreds and hundreds of retablos. And the last part I think is that uh, this is very customized in the sense that uh, um, uh, it seems like there's no miracle so small that can be actually uh, represented here. From very small things like getting lost in the city, like the retablo that I uh, uh, showed, to something larger like going to the Korea War, the Vietnam War. They, they're, they're, there's uh, some amazing retablos that uh, depict uh, uh, Mexican-Americans actually fighting in these wars and then coming back uh, uh, safe. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, there's definitely a lot of fluidity, uh, fluidity, I'm sorry, in terms of thinking about who commissions uh, these retablos uh, uh, in terms of gender and uh, the, the kind of motivations uh, for, for making these pieces. Another question that, that I, and, and I then want to make sure that you guys have a chance to ask one another questions, but another that um, as we're speaking about the, the, the specific objects, but also in your various descriptions is what I'm reminded of is that the, the, the term border, uh, uh, I believe frontiera in, uh, in, in Spanish, uh, uh, is is has many different definitions as you've outlined. It's both uh, they're physical, they're spiritual, they're emotional, psychological. Uh, it, it's and the, the exploration of those uh, through representation is is one that I find uh, particularly fascinating. And also want to now go back through the exhibition, uh, having listened to your presentations, to to imagine those different uh, contexts in which. Uh, border can be um, uh, uh, as part of the, the, the discourse. Not sure if that was a question. That was <laughs> one something a takeaway for myself. Any questions amongst yourselves? Well, I just had a comment actually. I enjoy the uh, Marcela's uh, take on Anita Brenner because, uh, I mean, and this actually relates to the notion of borders. Uh, we have to start with the fact that there was uh, really no border, right? Uh, uh, there is uh, a, an imposition of uh, uh, the United States uh, in terms of creating a border uh, 
after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in uh, 1848. But uh, between the 1840s and the 1890s, there's really no border. You have Apaches, you have uh, Kiowas, you have uh, lots of uh, different uh, indigenous peoples that uh, actually control uh, this part of the territory. You have uh, people who are colonists on either side of the border. So when you think about uh, you know how uh, this happened and why the border is so important. You have to kind of think about, uh, you know, what happens uh, before the Mexican Revolution, which, you know, is, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the big uh, motivators for uh, having people going to the U.S. and how um, uh, the lives of people who uh, decide to um, find uh, a, uh, a job or uh, find a, a different way of life uh, uh, is uh, closely entwined with the border, but you have a lot of border making processes that begin. Uh, they never begin in a vacuum. Uh, and uh, what I was uh, found really interesting about uh, rem remembering Anita Brenner, who was actually born in Mexico and then comes back, uh, goes to the US, comes back to Mexico, is that uh, after the Mexican Revolution, uh, which is uh, in stark contrast to the period we're living through right now, uh, you have lots of uh, artists like uh, Edward Weston, Tina Modotti coming into Mexico, Graham Greene uh, from, uh, uh, from Britain, uh, lots of people who come in and it's a border that is actually porous uh, in, in both directions, right? People are traveling uh, from Mexico uh, to find jobs and uh, a new uh, way of life. Uh, people are coming uh, from the uh, U.S. and different parts of the world and uh, there is a uh, a kind of closeness, I think, in terms of uh, uh, people on both sides of the border being aware of uh, each other's cultural experiences, uh, a, a point that was also kind of uh, uh, was driven home by the inclusion of Frida Kahlo in, in among the images. And this, in, in some ways, I mean, you know, since the retablos, uh, the earlier ones, I think, are from the 1910s and they go on till the late 60s, early 70s. It's like part of this uh, uh, very different uh, time in which uh, you have, uh, to some degree, a lot of attention uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, people in Mexico being aware of uh, U.S. culture, people in the U.S. being aware of Mexican culture. And in some ways, I mean, the, the kind of crisscrossing that you see uh, in the retablos takes for granted that people are going to go back and forth and, and travel uh, in ways that, and I mean, I'm trying to recapture this because we live in a very different age and it's almost impossible in some ways um, uh, uh, to, to think about how it would have been that uh, these countries would have been relatively close in uh, political, culture, economic terms, but also that there was a public um, a, uh, acknowledgement that, there, that this closeness uh, was there, was never going to, uh, to go away. So um, I guess my hope is that uh, obviously these retablos will come back and uh, uh, tell us not only about the past, but about a future in which uh, uh, the US and Mexico are not gonna be as divided as they are today. Well, I, what, I, what I would like to add to that, um, David, and also, right, I, I, I join you in your, in your hope for, you know, the inspiration that we can draw from this, this type of uh, uh, visits to the past, right, and to other moments of, of border making processes that were not as disheartening um, as the ones that we, we see today. And it's, it's interesting, and of course, I agree with you completely in, in your appreciation of um, the importance of the, uh, of the Mexican Revolution and your characterization of this whole era. Precisely, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking, a, I'm taking, I'm taking <laughs> sometimes I think that I'm taking this class, but I'm teaching this class about um, um, immigration precisely. It's called Migrant Latin America. And what I decided to do with this, um, with this semester of this, this particular course was to think about processes of migration to Mexico from other places, right? Because we tend to think that is always Latin America, the place that produces migrants that they go you know, to, to some other places. And I wanted to reflect on the moments where the, the direction of the, the flux has been reversed, right? And Anita Brenner, I think it's a fascinating character. Um, she was born in she was born in Mexico, but she was never not uh, a, a foreigner, right? Given that she was uh, Jewish as well, that their uh, her parents had immigrated into Mexico just before the revolution. With all the commotion of the revolution, she was born in Aguascalientes, so you know the north, barely northeast, right? Um, uh, and 
you know, with the, with the revolution, they had to go to the U.S., but again, they didn't go too far into the U.S., and, and Anita Brenner made a, a concerted effort to come back to Mexico after the revolution, and even though she, her family had been yet again displaced by the revolution, she had all the love and admiration for the, for the project of the revolution. What I was noticing in terms of the, of the periodization of the, of the um, uh, retablos that are included in this exhibit, is the fact that other than the ones that say only mid mid twentieth century, there are really no retablos, and uh, from from the decades of the twenties and the thirties, which is the moment precisely when Anita Brenner is the most active, um, and the, it, I mean, and she's the most active in this in this particular way in this particular arena of the what what has been named what she named actually along with. Um, uh, Jean Charlotte, the Mexican Renaissance, right? So they talk about this this really uh, prolific moment in terms of art and in terms of actually building a new version of what what Mexico should should be and should look like and should sound like. Um, and so what I you know what I when I was trying to make sense of the absence of these decades. Um, had precisely had to do precisely with it, this maybe this disruption of the border crossing, maybe there was happening something was happening during those uh, decades, and you know I, I I can think of like a despairing uh, explanation and a hopeful explanation. <laughs> so the despairing one would be that it was that you know that the violence that still lingered for for a few years, a few decades, couple of decades at least after the end of the armed conflict of the Mexican Revolution which ended in, in 1921, right? But still, like, we only had our first full-term president by the, by the very uh, late 30s, right? So almost, uh, you know, an extra 20 years of turmoil. So the, the, the least hopeful uh, version of my explanation of why we didn't have that many representations of miracles at the border during this time is because, you know, the violence, you know, forces people to change the, the, um, the normal uh, trajectories of their lives. And so there's, there's good reason to think that also processes of, of that, uh, the crossing of that porous border was also interrupted by this violence precisely. Um, and the hopeful one is that maybe, you know, the violence, I mean, the Mexican Revolution was really violent in the second half of the, of the, of the teens, right? So from, uh, I would say from 1940, sorry, 1914 until 1990, when Zapata is killed, uh, I would say that those are the main horrible years of the revolution, right? And so maybe the more hopeful one is that there was uh, so much work to be done in Mexico in terms of building this new nation, this new version of the post-revolutionary uh, uh, Mexico, right? That it was still to be discovered. Um, and that, you know, that, that people maybe had um, more of a reason to, to stay and work uh, within the country. I mean, I'm sure that neither <laughs> neither explanation suffices really to explain this absence. But I don't know. I, you know, it was just one of those things that got me thinking. This this particular absence of those decades. So I don't know if if any of you made anything of of this. Uh, you know, I was yeah going through the dates and and I noticed that odd uh, periodization there. I think we have some questions. Uh, Bart, do you want to uh, help us with them or? Absolutely. So yeah. one actually is from, uh, from President Bradley and uh, she uh, went through to see the exhibition last weekend, uh, seeing them so much and was noting how beautiful and almost like a toy, playful they were as, uh, as if a child were to understand them or the way a child would understand them. They seem very accessible even as themes are, are so heavy. Do children react to these in certain ways? Is an um, interesting question. So before we were talking about gender, and now we're talking about also uh, age differences, uh, and perhaps even anecdotally, if any of you have any ideas, not just about the retablos, but also about images uh, of this kind uh, that, uh, that you've all been presenting this evening. 
I can speak highly anecdotally that about uh, 45 minutes ago, my five-year-old was looking through my slides as I was preparing uh, the slides for, for this gathering and was really uh, captivated by the images of the retablo. So I don't know if this is uh, has purely anecdotal uh, value, but I do, I, I share that impression of President Bradley that there's something about the um, narrative quality of the images that connects, um, they, they gives the, the frames the event um, along with the intercessory saint and explanation um, has a really, a, there's a certain kind of, um, I don't know, there is a certain kind of a, appeal there and maybe the colors as well. I think one clue uh, and uh, you have to imagine all the retablos crowded together on one wall right next to the sacred image. So uh, this is how they're supposed to be displayed. And uh, in some ways they're actually jostling for attention from the viewers. So uh, they have to be like visually interesting. They have to tell a story. Uh, they're painted by people who are uh, usually you know, not uh, trained uh, formally in any kind of drawing or design. I mean, it's like uh, what people should call uh, art brut, uh, you know, a uh, uh, non, you know, kind of a, 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 an art uh, form that is not really um, a uh, academic in any way. So, uh, so these pieces actually have to pack a lot of punch. I'm not surprised that Kirsten's, uh, you know, kid uh, reacted so uh, interesting to them. And the other thing, of course, is that there's other retablos in other countries. And uh, I'm reminded that in Peru, for instance, uh, what you will call retablo is actually, it looks more like a small scene, like from uh, the Bible or from the uh, Jesus's life or an activity scene, but they're actually meant to be decorative, right? Uh, whereas this ones are supposed to be uh, expressions of gratitude uh, uh, and again you have to have the text and you have to have the image so uh, uh, I uh, it, it'll be interesting and I don't know uh, Bart if you like uh, actually have uh, like uh, a book with comments where people can leave uh, you know what they think about the retablos written but uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, particularly when you have visitors younger visitors from Poughkeepsie what they might uh, make uh, of this uh, narrative so I'll be very very interested in, in their reaction to it. Yeah, it's an interesting point, David, is that uh, in, uh, on the weekends when we're open to the general public, um, quick plug, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturdays and 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Sundays off of Raymond Avenue, uh, many of the visitors uh, are families. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, we don't, are, we're not capturing at the moment. We have been doing some virtual tours sp uh, for, for school groups. Uh, but they've been more tailored to the age, uh, specific ages. Um, I'm just going to mention, uh, it, there are a couple of questions here about uh, the, the regional uh, variety of these. And as you've just mentioned, David, is, is that these are, uh, I'm not going to say ubiquitous, but you can find them in many countries. You can find them uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, Central and, and South America. Um, and uh, also, uh, there are always questions that people ask about the provenance of these. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, David, is that these are constantly being uh, replaced and substituted and they're, they're ephemeral. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that temporal aspect of them is something that in the context that we've placed them uh, on display in this fashion doesn't really help to relate uh, that they are really just for a brief time. And it's more about the act of uh, and how the representation reinforces, uh, I think, uh, uh, Kirsten, as you, as you were talking about, is about the, uh, uh, the, the intercessory nature of, of the images uh, and how they uh, respond. In fact, you can find these whenever uh, flea markets come back. You can find them in flea markets all over the country and, and everywhere. Uh, I know they're sold in Italy uh, all the time because uh, uh, they, they have such a, a, a short lifespan. Uh, as they're being displayed publicly. Uh, and um, uh, the other, uh, another question here uh, uh, is from a professor at Colby College uh, that will actually be taking the exhibition uh, next, uh, next spring. 
uh, regarding spirituality and the environment and the various landscapes pictured in the retablo. Some are easy to distinguish, others portraying a dreamlike vision. Uh, can anyone comment on the relationship between the individuals, the environment pictured, what we can learn about those places in regard to Mexican culture and history? Um, I just wanted to come back, Bart, uh, to the question of origins and then let, uh, uh, you know, my fellow panelists talk about the larger relationship, uh, because that's where their talks were about. Uh, but we had also a couple of questions, uh, you know, asking whether they come from mostly northwestern Mexico and actually uh, uh, from uh, uh, Light Carrullo uh, regarding where exactly this, uh, you know, images come from, uh, who made them and uh, how do you collect them. Uh, so. Uh, just, you know, I, I, I'm actually had to look at the retablos. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I have my cheat sheet here, but uh, uh, a, uh, the, there was a catalog that was made, uh, uh, the original exhibit that came from Princeton. This is basically a private collection from uh, Douglas Massey and Jorge Duran. Anybody, as Bart was saying, could go into uh, different places where the retablos are sold because you have to think this is why, you know, some of them are older. Uh, some of them come from the 40s, 50s, 60s. The retablos crowd, uh, uh, images uh, in churches and churches at some point have to take them out so to put new ones again so there are some at least uh, my understanding is uh, up until the 1960s when uh, people really started to get into them collecting them uh, the retablos would have to be moved and then they were just uh, let loose on the market or people could keep them uh, in their homes. But in particular terms, I mean, it's, 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 it's not that these retablos come only from Northwestern Mexico or a particular region of Mexico, is that uh, a Massey and Duran, uh, Massey uh, uh, Duran is uh, at the University of Guadalajara, uh, happened to collect, I guess, nearby his home state of Jalisco. So a lot of them come from either Jalisco or Guanajuato, which is a neighboring state. Uh, about 70 of them are of unknown provenance. Uh, but they're probably from central western Mexico. So it's, it's just like basically the, the sample that they happen to collect uh, is biased towards this particular part of west central Mexico. Uh, and also, you know, of course, in terms of like how they're collected, uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, since the 60s, I think a lot of people have gotten into uh, serious collecting with retablos. This has come to be uh, in some ways uh, uh, revaluated as a, a, a an art form, a form of uh, social documentary, social comment uh, that uh, back then when people were doing them in the 1940s, 1950s, perhaps, uh, you know, people didn't pay much attention to them except to say, well, they're made by very devout people and at some point we have to get rid of them because there's more coming. So um, a, I think the ephemeral character of them plays a really important role in terms of like just pinpointing and pulling strands of very, very precise uh, life narratives and then kind of going away. But uh, uh, you have to think about it as, you know, what we're seeing here is basically uh, comes from whatever uh, Mass and Duran decided to in terms of uh, collecting these uh, retablos. If it's okay, David, I'm actually going to share my screen just for a second, just to show people the ent uh, entrance image uh, that we have here. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, so that it really helps to illustrate precisely the point you were making of, of how uh, they are typically, at least in this instance, uh, displayed. Uh, and also the other points that we're making about uh, how they're competing with one another, uh, uh, the ephemeral nature of them. Uh, so this is uh, the entrance to the exhibition. So I, I just want to make sure that the 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 question about the the uh, environment that's being depicted, uh, actual as landscapes, dreamlike vision, relationship between in, uh, individuals and environment, um, and uh, how that might be reflected, uh, a reflection of. Uh, Mexican culture history, if anyone wanted to touch that, touch on that. I can, I can comment a little bit on that. And, uh, and I think that again, uh, the, the, the particular use of, um, of, a, of a, an element in them that refers to the environment, for instance, um, I don't know, a particular river or a particular, particular mountain would have a specific meaning, you know, depending on the, on the miracle that had, you know, that, that, that was memorialized in, in the piece. But um, in general terms, I think that 
you know, I think that people like Anita Brenner, but also this other uh, anthropologist that I was that I was quoting that is younger and is working in the contemporary uh, context, they are very attentive to the to the fact that <laughs> Anita Brenner says something like, uh, "To be Mexican, to be Mexican is to uh, to to be aware of the of the non permanence of things." of the fact that everything could really change in a in a heartbeat and what she means by that i mean she can mean a number of things but one of the things that that we can understand by that phrase is that in mexico especially in the center of mexico in the capital we are so uh at the mercy of um geologic geological uh uh faults right that um that the environment is constantly a a, a source of of heartbreak um, you know, we have frequently we have earthquakes that are completely devastating. We have eruptions of volcanoes that are, again that are kind of close to Mexico City. So the, the one one continues uh, or continued uh, representation, for instance, in in some of the the urban mu murals that I was that I was referring to is the Popocatépetl, which is one of these these two volcanoes, active volcanoes that are close to the state of uh, Puebla, but also in the general vicinity of Mexico City. Uh, and so I think that it, it completely makes sense, or, you know, in the case of, the, of the, the, the stories of the miracles that are happening across the border, the river, it's another, it's another element that can, uh, that can be only controlled by asking for miracles. Right. Uh, I think that it, it, they, they fit very well the purpose of that, um, of that favor that has been asked of the saint or the, of, or the virgin, right? Because these are um, real menaces, real uh, threats that, that Mexican people understand as part of their lives. And, you know, and, and maybe one of the only ways that, that they can feel they exert power over them or at, little, at least, you know, control their own well-being, you know, in, 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 in those instances when, when those elements turn against them, uh, is by, by praying or by um, asking for the intervention of one of these saintly figures. So, I, you know, other than that, I mean, I, I, that's, that's what I imagine would be the most important um, element that has to do with, specifically, right, with the uh, uh, geography and the uh, the way that the environment is built into the Mexican consciousness. It's not even, you know, about like being Mexican or not. It's just about living in Mexico, right? You can be foreigner, you can be a, an extended tourist and you will be aware of the, of the seismic alarm. You will be aware of all these um, elements that can, you know, like <laughs> I guess that that's, uh, that's one reason why, uh, maybe you know mexican people are not as uh completely i don't know like the, the the pandemic right now feels not i'm not gonna say that it's a known quantity but it's you know but we have experienced being in in those moments of disruption where everything stops because it has to there's no way that it can continue and because of something that has to do with the environment or with a force that is not uh controlled by by human beings not not completely anyway. So yeah, so that's what I, you know, what I can, what I can say about that. I think Naomi was going to answer uh, Miriam Valle Mancilla's question. Is that correct? I saw something in the chat. I, I don't see that. Maybe. Okay, the, it, it was just deleted. <laughs> I think she's uh, just managing the question. Yeah, <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So uh, go ahead, David. David. Yeah, no, I, I guess uh, just thinking about uh, uh, the, the, the question uh, that, that came out to us from Miriam is uh, interesting in terms of like what you can learn from the retablos, right? Uh, 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 Massey and Durant propose different categories about like what are the general themes? They have making a trip, finding a way, legal problems, medical problems, getting by, and homecoming, right? So you have all these different uh, uh, narratives that definitely have to do with the process of migration, but also, and this is also something very important about this first wave of migration, coming back. 
uh, which, I mean, you know, something that I found really interesting in, in uh, uh, Kirsten's uh, presentation was that uh, picture of the sandals with the, uh, you know, the visa, <laughs> uh, 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 the U.S. visa. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, like, uh, uh, in more general terms about this question, how does an object actually that is absolutely kind of transient and uh, a uh, ephemeral uh, link up to something much larger, you know, whether it's a pair of sandals or a retablo on a wall. And I mean, I don't know if, you know, Kirsten had any other thoughts because uh, you were the one who came up with that. No, uh, I mean, I was just thinking mm -hmm. about this as, as we were discussing these questions about the Mm -hmm. the nature of the retablos as an event really right like mm -hmm. what the retablo is is like it's been recontextualized uh in in uh different ways but fundamentally it's this event of relationship um between the the commissioner and the saint and the event that it commemorates and so it has this architecture in time um that is is kind of radically like broken or reconfigured in the context of an exhibit and it reminded me sort of of the intervention of the photographer in that project that i shared with you at the end who recontextualizes uh through his own photography but then also the commentary of the owners of the objects these mundane uh things that were carried with right and it reminds me of another a uh, recent uh, photography project where the photographer is working at a detention center and amasses many, many of the same kind of objects and takes these really large format images of, of everyday objects. And so thinking about all of these different ways um, that artists are kind of like breaking and, and an exhibitor are breaking and collectors are breaking and reconfiguring the relationship uh, of like uh, the, the object to its aspiration and to its kind of vertical dimension, right? Between the um, this world and and, and divine um, realm of aspiration or or um, supplication. And I don't know. I was I found this really really rich question. I think both to, to understand what the exhibit is as opposed to what Orthopolis are in a. a in a real, properly religious devotional context, right? But then to also think about it comparatively with these other objects that take on different kind of significance as they move, right? And as they take on these layers. So the, the picture of the pair of shoes with the American flag, the, um, the teenager who owns these shoes notes in his commentary, in his, his commentary, which he writes in Arabic around the image that the way that these shoes have become a visa is by being included in this photography project, mm -hmm. right? So they've both been the shoes that he's worn on his own journey, but then they're traveling even further because they're becoming part of this exhibition and now we're seeing them, right? So it's a way of also incorporating the viewer into the, um, I don't know, into the, into the travel, the transmigration kind of experience of, of these mundane objects that I think we get incorporated into as uh, viewers of Eratopoulos in the lobe, right? Which is a different way of seeing them uh, than in other contexts. So I think that's really, really rich set of questions. Yeah, I mean, just briefly in response to that, I think this kind of thinking about migration narratives through objects uh, is something that uh, goes well beyond. I mean, you have the Quills project that uh, Barth had mentioned, you have the purpose shoes that Kirsten has, has mentioned, uh, but uh, Unfortunately, now we have an archaeology of uh, illegal immigration. Uh, you have uh, uh, work like that of Jason de Leon, uh, the author of uh, uh, Land of Open Graves, who uh, basically devoted a few years to collecting uh, as if it were basically an archaeological site, uh, the kind of uh, remains uh, a, uh, that were left behind. And I'm thinking here about uh, you know sweaters, uh, a, a shoes, and other things that were left behind by migrants, particularly in the Sonora, uh, Arizona desert. Um, and uh, a, uh, this is, I guess, when you think about objects, it's also important to think that uh, uh, you know. And I guess I'm, I'm thinking here about uh, how an anthropologist or archaeologist will think about them. These are uh, not just. Uh, you know, uh, something that you can look at uh, and think about, but they're evidence of a 
transit that took place. And in this particular case, I mean, uh, I, you know, opened, uh, I guess, a, a newspaper today and I found that uh, uh, there's about 545 kids uh, whose parents are unaccounted for that were separated at the border. So you, you, you have this sense that they are all these narratives of loss uh, that has been endured uh, because of the passage across the border. Uh, sometimes it ends uh, in tragedy, sometimes it ends terribly, but you have these objects that in some ways uh, can help you. And in the case of uh, Jason de Leon's work, I mean, uh, they actually have helped uh, families being reunited with uh, uh, their remains of their loved ones. Uh, in, I mean, I don't know what's gonna help, particularly in the case of separated children, but I think uh, uh, a, uh, the, the uh, uh, future administration will have a very difficult task in terms of tracing through all sorts of evidence, uh, you know, uh, uh, how to reunite uh, uh, these children with their parents as they were separated at the border. And in, there's, there's so much here to, uh, to digest and, and actually, as I mentioned, looking forward to going back into the exhibition to look at these things. But to your point, uh, David, um, how much uh, the visualization uh, is associate uh, how we associate uh, trauma with the visualization and, and thinking of uh, the, the horrific uh, photograph of uh, the father and daughter uh, in the Rio Grande. Uh, uh, and, and again, uh, I think that uh, artists, uh, as well as these objects and uh, help us uh, to, to focus our attention uh, that is necessary in, in addressing these these much larger issues. So I, I frankly could continue this conversation and, and listen to the three of you uh, all night long, uh, but I do want to be mindful of, of our uh, audience here uh, and uh, uh, to thank you uh, profusely for providing different sets of lenses uh, for us as we look at these works, uh, which which take on uh, more and more meaning uh, for for all of us uh, through your uh, uh, expertise and uh, different uh, perspectives. So I want to thank you on behalf of of everyone who's tuned in this evening. And because it's being recorded, uh, we'll also have an opportunity to uh, make this an ongoing resource. So uh, thank you again to all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.